Could we stand? Thank you, Lord Jesus. We praise you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Good morning to everyone. Good morning. We welcome you this morning. We're so honored to have as guest the Fair family with us this morning. Let's give them a hand this morning. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Liam, so glad to have you with us today. What a beautiful time of the year. I just feel a spirit of thanksgiving, do you? Yes. Do you? Let's not be like the world and lose thankfulness. Yes. Let's just thank the Lord today. God, we thank you and we praise you. We worship you today. Lord, we thank you for this country. We thank you for life. We thank you for health. We thank you for this church. We thank you for these brothers and sisters, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your presence, Lord God, in our midst this morning. We thank you because you're still loving and reaching and uh, desiring to save us, to heal us, to deliver us, and to make us more like you. We thank you for each and every one here today. We worship you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Pray one more time, Lord Jesus. Sister Hannah, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's lift him up again. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this day. We bless you, Lord. You are a mighty Savior, God. Thank you, Jesus. Clap a little louder than before. I want to sing a little louder than before. I want to jump higher than before. I want to shout louder than before. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. Lord, we lift you up today. We bless your name, God. Thank you, Jesus. No more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage, I am free, yeah. No more shackles, no more chains, no more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage, I am free, yeah. Oh, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. No more shackles, no more chains. No more bondage, I am free, yes. Dance the dance of freedom, say hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We lift you up today, God. We bless you. We thank you for freedom that you've given us. Lord, we worship you today. You are an awesome God. You are a mighty God. We bless you, mighty Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we love you. Hallelujah. Let's give him a shout of praise today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship you, King. We magnify you, Savior. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you, God.
never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working you never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working never stop, you never stop working Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are worship him today like he's the way maker. He's our miracle worker. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Say thank you, Jesus, if you can feel him already working in this place. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your presence this morning, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. We've got several, uh, several prayer requests this morning. And as we go to him, let's remember that he is our way maker. He is capable of doing anything. There is nothing that is greater than our God. Amen. 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 We've got several people that we're praying for this morning um, with cancer. We're going to lift up the names Vicki, Diane, Sarah, we're going to lift up Al Nash and David Rainey. If you can remember one of those names, lift them up and pray against, let's pray against cancer in their lives. That's Vicki, Diane, Sarah, Al Nash, and David. We're going to um, pray. We've got several who, obviously, right now, times are tough with COVID. And we've got several we're praying for there. There's a, a minister named Brandon Pendergrass. I haven't heard about him in a little bit, but he's been struggling for it's been over a month now. He's a young man, young minister, and we're going to pray that God completely heals that man. He's got some little children that need him in his life as well as a church family, but we're going to pray against COVID in his life. Michael Davis, we lifted him up last week, and we're going to lift him up this week who has COVID and just pray, pray against that in his life. And Dixie Crutzinger, we're going to lift her up. She's a friend of... Um, from Pastor Michael and Sister John, I believe, from their church and Flora before they um, joined us here. And we're going to lift up Jody. We're, this is uh, Brother Frank back here. Um, this is his mom that we prayed for after service, if you guys remember last week. Now, she's getting better. Thank you, let's, just, let's just thank Jesus for a moment. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We're grateful with you guys this morning that God's healing her and we're believing with you that he's going to completely heal her body. Amen? Amen. 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 Okay, we're going to lift up Carrie Rainey, who's um, suffering with some heart conditions. Last week he had pneumonia. I don't know his current condition, but we're going to continue to pray for Carrie. We're going to continue to lift up John Gieselman this morning. We're going to pray that God's going to touch that man and the physical things that he deals with. Um, we're going to pray for Sister Susan. She has an unspoken request this morning, and we're going to lift her up. And God's going to move in her life today. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We're going to continue to lift up Pastor David's brother, Ron. His name's Ron Houseworth. Um, we're going to pray 
for his physical being, but we're also going to pray that God touches him this morning. Amen. Encur- he needs encouragement, I believe. We're going to pray for um, Sister Sue Houseworth, who's not with us this morning. There's a, an unspoken request that she has that she needs a touch in her body today. Um, we're going to pray for both of There you are. We moved you today. Brother Denny Robinson, he's got two daughters that we're going to continue to pray for. Brandy, who was in an accident a little over a year ago, I think, and we're just continuing to believe that God's going to completely restore her. And we're praying for his daughter, Stephanie, who's pregnant, dealing with some complications. But we know that complications, again, aren't bigger than our God. Amen? He can handle this. We're going to, um, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We're going to lift up Sister Patty Payne today. She's, um, we're just going to pray God's favor in her life. She's, she's battling for custody of her grandson. It's been an ongoing thing. It's drug out a long time, and she is just asking that God's hand would just reach down into her situation and that this would just be expedited and resolved and completed and done. And we're believing he can do that, sister. We're going um, to continue to pray for revival. And we're going to pray that God's going to move in this service. I, I believe that God is already moving in this Thank service. You, Lord. Thank but we're you, believing that God's going to do something big. Big. Let's big. Big today. Amen. Somebody's going to leave different than they came in. Okay? I believe that. Amen. All right, let's go to him this morning. Lord, we love you and we thank you and we praise you for what you're already doing in this place, Lord. Lord, we come to you in faith, lifting up every one of these people that we have spoken their names already, Lord. We're believing in your name, Jesus, that you are going to heal Vicki, Lord. We're believing for complete healing in her life, in Diane's life, in Sarah, who's been given... Again, a bleak diagnosis, but Lord, we, we know you don't listen to doctors because you are, you're big enough, Lord, that no matter what they have said, we know that you can work and heal Sarah right now. And Lord, we continue to lift up the name Al Nash in Jesus' name, believing, Lord, that you're going to heal him. And David Rainey this morning who needs a touch. He needs a touch in his physical man. And Lord, I just believe that he needs a touch this morning in his spiritual man, Lord. And we just pray that he would hear your voice, that you would move in your in his life, and that you would have an opportunity to just open his eyes, pull back the veil, and he see just exactly who you are and how you see see him this morning. Thank you, Jesus, Lord. Lord, and we want to lift up all these people who are struggling with COVID this morning. And we want to pray, Lord, that you would just touch Brandon Pendergrass today. Lord, this has gone on long enough. And in Jesus' name, we're speaking healing into his life on his behalf, but on those little kids' behalf who need their daddy. We just pray that this would, he would continue, he would just start get stronger and that he would be healed, Lord. We pray for Michael Davis. Lord, we speak against sickness in his life. Dixie Crutsinger, we want to lift her name up to you this morning and just pray that you would heal her of any symptom that she is still suffering and struggling with and just speak health in her body. And Lord, we want to continue to lift up Jody, Brother Frank's mom. Lord, we want to thank you right now. We want to thank you that you have moved on their behalf, on our behalf, as we lifted her up to you last week. And we want to pray that you would continue to move in her life today in Jesus' name. We're believing for complete healing in Jody's life today. And we thank you for that in advance, Lord. Lord, we lift up Kerry Rainey to you today, Lord, in the heart trouble that he has, the pneumonia he struggled with. Lord, just everything that Kerry comes against, Lord, we just lift him up to you, and we just believe you for his restoration of Kerry today. And Lord, we lift up John Gieselman to you this morning and everything that he deals with in his physical body, Lord. We're just believing right now, Lord, that you would just touch him, that you would restore him, and we speak this in your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. And Lord, we want to lift up Sister Susan this morning, Lord. 
Lord, this unspoken request that she's had, Lord, we just pray that your spirit would move on her, Lord, and that you would become more real today, standing next to her than you have ever been, that she would feel you moving in this situation, Lord, and that there would be no doubt in her mind, Lord, that you have her situation under control, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you for that. Lord, we lift up round house worth to you Lord we continue to lift him up to you knowing Lord that he is familiar with you he knows you and we pray Lord that today wherever he is that he feels you the same way that we're feeling you right now in this place that he would be encouraged that he would not struggle with depression, loneliness, frustration. But Lord, that as you physically heal him, Lord, that he would be encouraged knowing, Lord, that you are king and that you are Lord. And Lord, we want to lift up Sister Sue to you this morning, Lord, and what she's dealing with. We just pray right now where she's at in Jesus' name that she would receive healing right now. Lord, we want to lift up Brother Denny's daughters to you, Lord. Brandy, we pray for... For her, Lord, we ask that you would just completely just restore her from this accident. Lord, we're praying for complete health in her body. We're praying for Stephanie. We just pray, Lord, that you would move. Lord, we know that you are bigger than the complications that she's facing in this pregnancy. Lord, we've seen you move in ladies who are pregnant. And we've seen you work miracles. And Lord, we're praying for a similar miracle this morning in the name of Jesus and Stephanie's life. Lord, we lift up Patty Payne to you this morning and what she's going through, this situation that just drags on and on. And Lord, we just pray that you would just move in her life, encourage her that you're in control, but that she would see your hand in this situation, that she would receive your favor. And Lord, that she would this would just be done, uh, settled, and she can just rest with peace of mind, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, we believe that some of this has probably caused some of her physical condition so Lord we just pray Lord for a spirit of trust over her right now that she would be able to trust you in this and cast all of her cares on you all anxieties we speak against right now in Jesus name and Lord we just want to continue to ask Lord that you would shield this church body from the coronavirus that's been going around this community Lord we're just going to speak health over this place over Landmark Church Lord we believe that your spirit of love this morning is going to protect us and we speak this in your name Jesus Lord and if there was any unspoken request Lord I didn't ask anybody to raise their hands but Lord I just believe right now Lord that you are moving in every person's life today that just because there wasn't a, hand, a raising of hands that everyone who has a need Lord that they're going to hear an answer that they're going to receive direction Lord we're just believing Lord for you to move in everyone's life today and Lord we're praying for revival we want to continue to pray Lord that you would move in this church that you would move in this community Lord we know what it's like to not have you and we're grateful to have you we love you Jesus and we want people to have the same hope that we have, Lord, equip this body, equip us, strengthen us, give us direction, wisdom, Lord. Just send us out, Lord, to, to minister, Lord, to these people who are lost, who are hurting. And Lord, we just want to ask, Lord, that you would, I just believe that someone today, you're already speaking to them. Someone already has a need. Someone already knows what I'm talking about. And Lord, I just pray that they would act that there would just be a radical move of your spirit over this place, that you would just minister to people, speak to them, Lord, and that they would meet you where you're at, and they would be pulled up out of where they're at, and that they would receive what you have this morning, Lord, and we ask that you would just anoint Pastor Michael today. Lord, we pray that his words... Lord, that they would just bring forth fruit in each of our lives. Anoint his lips, Lord, and give us a heart to hear. Let us not be callous in our hearts, Lord. Let us be soft to your spirit and hear exactly what you want to do in our lives. Let us leave this place changed this morning, Lord. You are awesome, and we thank you, Lord. We... We know, Lord, that you want to move. We thank you that you're going to move. And we stand in confidence in your spirit this morning, knowing that you are going to do a mighty work in this place this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Give him a hand clap this morning if you believe that he's going to work in this place, if he's already moving in your life. 
We want to thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, we lift you up today. You are mighty God. You are an awesome God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You 
bless you, Savior. Come on, somebody, clap your hands and lift your voice to the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lord. Oh, hallelujah to the Lord. Oh, come on, somebody, let yourself go and worship just for a moment. We praise you. God, we magnify you. Lord, some of us have waited all week long to come together with people of like faith to lift you up. Come on, don't worry about your neighbor. Just say, excuse me, I gotta give God praise for a moment. Oh, hallelujah. I've had a long week by myself. I can't help it when I get in, when I get in God's presence with God's people. Hallelujah to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That's all right. Come on, somebody lift your voice. Somebody shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Not part of me, not a little bit of me, not some of me, not most of me, but all. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Could you shout that name this morning? Would you shout that name this morning? Come on, somebody shout that name this morning. I want you to know when we said that name, demons trembled. I want you to know cancer got nervous. I want you to know that things in your life that have been holding you back are afraid because somebody shouted the name that is above every name, the name that every knee has to bow to and every tongue has to confess that he is the Lord. Oh, would you shout that name? Praise his name. Somebody clap your hands to the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, I could not wait for Sunday. Hallelujah, since we left here Wednesday night, I have just, I, I could not hardly contain myself waiting to get back again in the house of God. I'm excited about what God wants to do in this place. If you are, would you praise him one more time? Hallelujah to your name. Hallelujah to your name. Hallelujah to your name. Hallelujah to your name. We praise you, we praise you, we praise you. Thank you, Jesus. If you have your Bibles... We are going to go to a very familiar passage of Scripture. I believe God wants me to draw a little more out this passage. It's 2 Kings, the fourth chapter. We're going to read verses 1 through 7. And I want to say, as we're turning here, it is so very good to see a very good friend of mine, Brother Frank Fair, uh, here with us today. And the guests that are with him, we want you to know how much we appreciate you. I would, I would apologize for us getting a little wild sometimes, but uh, it would take me a few minutes to allow everyone to testify of where God has brought some of us from. And uh, so we don't know how to act in public sometimes when the Spirit of God starts moving. Hallelujah. And we start feeling the Holy Ghost move. Some of us, we don't know what's proper and what's not. and We just have to get excited and, and, and let it go. Amen, said the church. Hallelujah. Brother Frank, we, we've had your mother in our prayers and believe that God is, is performing a miracle. Yes. Yes. Amen. We believe that. Amen. Amen. All of our home folk, all of our guests, uh, our friends and family, all of our followers that are on Facebook, we want you to know how much we appreciate you this morning as well. And we hope that you can feel the power of God exercising uh, through the airwaves today. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. And if you would, I'd ask you to read out loud with us. I, 
They're going to do their best to keep up with me. I know on the board back there, uh, if you don't have your Bibles, but there's something about speaking the word. I'd ask you if you would to stand with us if you're able. It's customary for us here at uh, Landmark to stand for the reading of the word. If you're not able, we understand that. But uh, if you are, we'd ask you to do that. Thank you so much. And read aloud with us. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. Somebody say full. full. So she went from him and shut the door. Somebody say shut the door. Upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were, when the vessels were, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more, and the oil, the oil, then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil. And pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children on the rest. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want to talk to us for a few moments this morning from this thought, the power of empty. The power of empty. Turn to your neighbor and look him eyeball to eyeball and tell him the power of empty. Find somebody across the room, look at them eyeball to eyeball and tell them the power of empty. Come on, look at your problem, look at your situation, look at your temptation, look at your distraction, look at your depression, look at your discouragement and shout the power of empty. Come on, let me hear it. The power of empty. Lord, I pray in your name. I pray in your mighty, wonderful, holy, and powerful name that you would move on me and through me, move in me and out of these lips of clay. Let me speak with power and anointing what you have given to us today. God, I pray in your name that you would open our hearts that we would receive. Lord, don't let us be like spectators at a sporting event, but God, let us, I pray, put ourselves in a position to receive a position that says, God, I want all that you've brought for me today. I don't want to leave here wasting a drop or with a drop falling on the ground beside me. I, I want it all. Would you make that your prayer right now, God? Let me have it all. I don't want to escape this today. I want to be moved and challenged and touched and changed. For the glory of God, I pray in the wonderful name of Jesus and everyone said amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I have a message for us today, not a sermon. I feel that way about everything I bring across this pulpit, but sometimes I, I, I really feel that, if that makes sense to you. I come to you today with a message from the Lord that I believe can be life-changing if we can get a hold of it. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Amen. It is with great spiritual deliberation that, that, that I approach this text, not in the traditional sense of merely exegeting the text itself, though the text itself is it's, it's extremely profound as as I find for myself in many scriptures, there are so many things you can extrapolate from scripture, especially when you understand the completeness of the context. What we're looking at today comes at a time where a widow woman whose husband, now deceased, had formerly served Elisha as a servant, one who sought 
to better understand how to release his prophetic gift. It's important to note because Elisha himself had once sought Elijah to better pull his gift out of him. And I can't help but notice that, that you always need somebody else to help you pull out of you what God has put inside of you. Having that experience himself as he served Elijah, he then had regiments of sons under him that he trained in the ways of the Lord. And it's interesting to note that he had to be older than his mentees. And he had survived something that some of his sons had not. So we enter into this cross-generational conversation between the wife of his successor and she comes reminding him that her husband was loyal and was serious about God, but he died. And I feel to pause and note the reality of how bad things happen to good people. The woman is clear as she refers to him as a man of God. But that didn't stop death. Death has the ability to define, defy reason and pick and choose whoever it will, whenever it will, sparring, sparing not the young or the old. There is no guarantee because you're in your teenage years that you will make it to be old. All the Bible tells us is a gift given by God and it's not a promise that's espoused to us to live long enough to gray. And, you know, I don't know how I feel about that. I, I tell Sister Jonna sometimes I feel like going to get some just for being and brushing it through this beard. And she, she disagrees. <laughs> but to live long enough to gray is a gift that's given to us by God. It's not a right that we can assume. And what that tells me, Pastor David, is that we must then live every single day of our life as if there is no tomorrow. I wonder how that would change who we are and how we are and what we are if we really understood the magnitude of, of what life really is and what it means. You and I are not promised our next breath. Every breath that we take is, it's a gift from God. You know, last Sunday we talked about praising God and worshiping God for the small things. We, we, we explored the, the, the things that we have in our lives that so many of us take for granted. Uh, to my knowledge, there's no one in here today that had to have help because you were blind. Uh, to my knowledge, there, there was no one that, 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 that's sitting here today that, that needs a, someone to sign language to you, the words that are coming forth from the music and coming out of my mouth because you're deaf. There is, as I look across this congregation, a blessed people. And, and I'm just expressing to you that it behooves us to be thankful every day for the opportunity that we have. Now, we, we can debate about how much time we have and how much time we don't have. But in all reality, in all actuality, we know that we're going to make room for the things that are important to us. And I, I would dare say today that if we were honest, that God has not been a top priority in our life. Now, I'm not saying he's not a priority, but I am suggesting that if we're to take a long look at who we are as people, we do not live our lives the way we would if God was the priority. And I believe God is calling people who are willing to recognize. He's calling a church and a church body that are willing to recognize that he is the only priority. I, I've been involved in, in, in relationship counseling for, for many, many years. And I remember, uh, I remember being in a counseling session one time and, and, and the husband was, was really upset. And, and, uh, and, and he said, you know, at, at very best, I really think that this is 60-40. 
because I'm the man of the house and this should be 60-40. And the wife, she said, no, this should be 50-50. The reality of relationship is that those numbers don't compute. It should always be 100-100, right? Each party has to be giving 100. And when we look at our relationship with God, it's very lopsided. We expect mighty things from God just like we do from our our partner that we have here on earth. And, And men, I'm telling you today, if you don't take care of the woman that you have by your side, you run the risk of losing her. You, you can't have a relationship with your spouse where you're investing 35% and expect 100% in return. And so it is with God. We cannot have a relationship with God where we give God 20, 30, 40, 80% and withhold 20 for ourselves and other things and expect God to be 100% invested in what's going on between us. Am I making sense to you? I believe that God right now, today, in these last days, Brother Piercy, you think we're in the last days? I absolutely do. If God doesn't come for another 400 years, you and I have made it by the skin of our teeth. The Bible says a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. God doesn't view time the same way that we do. I'm telling you, we're running out of time. If, if, if you die before the rapture happens, that is not where you ran out of time. You didn't run out of time because of the rapture. You ran out of time today when you had the opportunity to give God everything that you have and everything that you are and everything that you will be. And we spend so much, can I talk to us today? We spend so much of our time investing in things that are not eternal because it lines up with our idea of what life is and what life needs to be. And because we're funneling ourselves into that, we actually exclude ourselves from the blessing of God. If we would truly understand, if we if we could really, if we if we could get our minds to completely understand what God has for us, brother Denny, it shows us that in God we have everything. We, we try to take God and make sure that God understands our agenda and our five-year plan and how we're going to get from point A to point B. And we want to make sure that God is going to give us enough money, the right kind of car, make sure we have enough food, and make sure our family is A, B, C, and D. And all that time, God is saying, if you'll just get yourself in me and allow me to work the way I can work, you don't have to worry about any of those other things. When we understand that Christ is the only provision that we need, when we understand if my focus is on him, the promise is if our eyes are on him, if our focus is on him, if we're knocking on his door and seeking after his face, that he will open up the windows of heaven and provide things for us that are in our finite minds cannot even begin to comprehend. There is no guarantee and we need to live every day as if we do not have tomorrow. I believe every single one of us, if we, I believe churches would be full if we lived our life that way. I think it was yesterday we, we were celebrating my wife's birthday and it was no, it may have been Friday. I don't remember now. But a, a, a thing came across all of our phones from the state of Illinois that said, "As of today, we're entering into this tier, and these are the things you need to know and be aware of." I wonder what would change if Jesus sent out one of those messages and says, "I'll be here at five o'clock tomorrow." 
I, I wonder how different we would act. I wonder, I wonder if we could get outside of our comfort zone then. I wonder if we could put the TV remote down or the computer or the phone or bejeweled down for five minutes to tell somebody about the goodness of God if it was plastered across our cell phones telling us I'll be there at five. Such was the case with this woman's husband never knowing that he would never finish raising his sons or that he and his wife would not grow old together, that, that there would not always be there, that, that, that he would not always be there as a force to provide and protect for his family. The, the force is gone, the strength is abated, and the breath has gone out of his nostrils, and there is nothing left as evidence he was ever there except for the cry of his widowed wife concerns of his son in his absence has left them uncovered. His absence has left them ill-prepared for the challenges of time. And they have suffered not only the emotional toll of him being snatched out of the house, but also the economic impact of his provision gone. Little by little, cupboards grew empty, the wallet grew light, and they started living off of promises they could not fulfill. By the time Elisha steps on the scene, this woman's pockets are empty and the cupboards are bare and the creditors are full and she's down to losing her sons. No mother on the face of this earth wants to give up her sons to pay off her debt. We know expressly this was not the way she wanted her life to go and yet this was where it was and, and she was a woman of God. Now there are other successful women in the Bible and it's not clear whether they were truly women of God or not but this was a woman of God and her circumstance shows trouble will and can and will come to anybody. I don't care how you pray. I don't care how you fast. I don't care how you talk in tongues and dance all over the living room or all over the front of the church. It does not exempt you from having dark days and empty days and days of tumultuous winds and complex issues. We step into this woman's life not during the good times but in the middle of a dark moment. And the Bible doesn't show us when things were good. It doesn't give us insight to when the cupboards were full and the closets were overflowing and the bank account had cash to spare because it is irrelevant. God is showing us how to survive emptiness. She lost everything. The only thing she had left was her sons and, and here she is about to lose them too. And Elisha comes on the scene and, and she reminds him of who her husband was. And she reminds him that, that her husband was his mentee and, and that he went to his school of prophecy and, and that he was a good man of God but now he's gone. She, I believe, is trying to create relationship with Elisha. So he has a vested interest in responding to her. In the scripture, she doesn't come to him in her name because she doesn't have the clout in her name. She doesn't have the clout in her name to provoke a miracle, but she knows whose name to call to get Elisha's attention. And she says, my husband, thy servant, my husband, one of your spiritual sons, is dead, and I'm his wife, and they're about to come and get my sons. And Elisha says, well, what am I supposed to do with you? What do you do when you meet someone in a particular slice of their life that threatens to define and detour the rest of their life? What, what do you do when you meet someone at a moment of, at a moment and time in, uh, of desperation? What do you do when they're expecting you to do something beyond human rationale? He says, what am I supposed to do with you? And then he asks this paramount question and I won't spend a lot of time there this morning, but he asked her, what do you have in your house? And I think it's important, you've heard it come across this pulpit clearly before, that we understand God will already always use something you already have for the miraculous. 
She says, well, there's a pot of oil. Uh, there's a handful of meal or there's two fish and five loaves of bread what we need to uh, we need to quit looking for skies to part and, and neon signs to be hanging on the side of the moon telling us where to go and what to do and that our miracles on its way miracles are born out of normalcy miracles are birthed when God begins to magnify what we've overlooked and, and what we have deemed invaluable it, it might have been invaluable in our hands it might not have been valuable in your hands but it becomes invaluable when you place it in the hands of God something that we've walked past every single day of our lives and what the pro prophet's presence does is illuminates the things that we have ignored what do you have in your house you're telling me about what you lost and I want to know about what you have left. You see, God doesn't need what you lost. He's, he's not interested in you giving him a litany of who all left you and who forsook you. That's carnal conversation. God doesn't need anything that we've lost to bless us. He will always use what we have left. And she said, I don't have anything left. She said, I got nothing. And they go back and forth bantering toward a miracle. And as they banter back and forth toward a miracle, the Holy Spirit has only written for us those things that are necessary that our faith might be built. And by eavesdropping, if you will, on this conversation, we understand this account is not written for, our, our, the, for, for the historicity of this woman's life. God, God's not dealing with her bank account during the time that she had a husband. God, God doesn't remind her of her good days because faith does not shine in your good days. Can I get a witness? Faith shines when all hell is breaking loose in your life. You understand you can't uh, you can't fully appreciate uh, the power of God uh, and experience the power of God uh, when you're on the mountaintop. Uh, who needs God when you're standing on the mountain and all your bills are paid and you feel good and everybody likes you and you've got people following after you? No, we need God when we're in the valley and at our wit's end and we don't know what else to do. And if I can use my imagination, if you'll permit me this morning, I imagine in my own mind she had spent many sleepless nights. The, the Bible doesn't say it, Brother Frank, but I know if you're about to take my sons, I'm not resting a full night. She had turmoil and discomfort. She was stressed out and she says, I don't have anything save a pot of oil. And he says to the woman, who is already in debt, go and borrow. My credit is bad and the creditors are coming to take my children and you're telling me to go borrow. You have the nerve to tell me I'm not empty enough. Can you not see my situation and understand that I'm as low as low can go? And I, I want it to sink in into your head where God is saying it's not bad enough. When it gets bad enough, you will see my hand. When it gets bad enough you will see my glory when it gets bad enough I'll open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing you don't have room enough to receive but what you're presenting to me right now is child's play go and borrow what I'm talking about today is for radical people this is not for your average, ordinary, superficial Sunday morning person who just stumbled into this service on Facebook. This is for radical people who are backed in a corner and shoved up against the wall and you don't have any other choice but to believe God. Why? Because if you don't believe God, you're going under. If you don't believe God, you're going down. If you don't believe God, you're going to lose your mind. If you don't believe God, you're going to lose everything you have. If you don't believe God, you'll never get out of this. I want to talk to somebody who's in enough trouble to hear this message today. 
What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying some of us have too much to get this message. Some of us are too intellectual to get this message. Some of us are too spiritual to get this message. Some are too full to get this message. God is best experienced from a place of vulnerability. So much so that that, that the prophet or, or the apostle said, in my weakness, he is made strong. All of this teaching we're doing on praising, worshiping, and how to get glory out of God and all that, all that's cute for people who are not in trouble. It only becomes sustenance when you're desperate enough for the word to come alive. When it's, when it's more than just about, hey, I wonder, Pastor, can you tickle my ears today? Oh, Sister Hannah and Sister Shella, can you guys hit the right note for me today? It's gotta become a place of desperation where you're saying, I have to have the word of God come alive. I can't take another step. I can't live another moment. I can't go any further until the word of God comes alive. Go borrow from your neighbors. Go borrow vessels from your neighbors. Not only did he say go borrow vessels. And that's really not what I came to preach about. I came to preach about it's our nothingness that attracts God. It is our void, it is the vacuum, it is the abyss of need in our life that attracts God. It's not your stuff, it's not your degrees, it's not your money, it's not your outfit. It is the void somewhere down inside of your soul and you have to be empty enough to have a faith experience. You have to be vulnerable enough to have a faith experience. Jesus does not need to help you walk when you're standing on concrete. It's only when you say, Jesus, if that's you, bid me come and you step out on the sea and begin to walk on water. You have to be vulnerable enough for God to get your full and undivided attention. God has this woman's attention and he says, go borrow from your neighbors. Now it's one thing to be broken. It's another thing to tell your neighbors you're broke. They're already talking. They're already looking at you. They already notice the lawn's not manicured and your house needs painted. They already notice you haven't had a manicure and a pedicure in over three months. They already know you haven't got your hair did and God says go and tell your neighbors that you need something. And he doesn't tell you to beg for it in the sense of asking them to give it to you. He says this won't take long. I'm just going to borrow it. When you hear the word borrow, it's just like Jesus borrowing the tomb. This won't take too long. It's, it's just going to be a few days. I, I need to borrow it because I've got to get through something. The situation that you're in right now will not last. You just need to borrow a solution because after a while, everything that you've lost is going to come back to you. Everything that got away is going to come running back. Everybody who walked away and walked off and turned their back is going to come knocking on your door. I've come to tell somebody today this is only a temporary situation. And he says go to your neighbors and knock on doors with your sons. The ones they're about to take. When you borrow something, you understand it has to have value. I'll prove it to you. None of us are going to go up to a homeless man and ask him for a loan. Nobody goes to a trash can and says, hey, I want to borrow some food. When you borrow something, there is a perceived value in order for you to go after it. And what God says he values is vessels. 
Oh, my Lord. Oh, why, why does God value vessels when everybody else values content? Oh, my Lord, have mercy. <laughs> God says go borrow vessels. Everybody else goes to the store to buy perfume, but God says go buy perfume bottles. <laughs> Most people don't go to the store to get a bottle. I- I've never been standing in line in Walmart and have somebody come up carrying a bottle of bleach, Brother Adam, and say, hey, I want to pour this bleach out. I just came for the bottle." But God says borrow vessels and not just any kind of vessels. He says I want you to borrow empty vessels in order to get your miracle. I'm not using any kind of vessel. Don't bring me a vessel that's half full. Don't don't bring me one that's three quarters full. Don't bring me one that's a third full. They have to be empty to be eligible. And I here to ask you this question. Are you empty enough this morning for God to move in your life? What are you saying, pastor? I'm saying that if you have one an idea left in your brain, you're not empty enough. If you've got a plan B and a backup plan and a contingency contingency plan and a plan C, you're not empty enough. You hear what I'm saying today? God said, I want to borrow, I want you to borrow vessels that are empty. And the reason God led me to this text is not so much for the text itself. It is the text against the times we are living in because we are living in some times right now of emptiness. I won't ask you to raise your hand because I'm not afraid. I'm afraid we wouldn't get an honest response. But I'm standing here this morning wondering if there's anybody in this place, in this service, across Facebook who's felt empty. Now, I want to take time to draw a distinction between being empty and being tired. If you're just tired, You can get some sleep and wake up in the morning and you're going to feel better. But if you're empty, sleep doesn't resolve it. Is there anybody who woke up feeling as bad as you did when you laid down? It's it's not that you're tired, it's that you're empty. And this message goes to people who've been having this indescribable feeling that you don't even understand how to explain yourself that that you have seen so much and heard so much and watched so much and read so much and seen so much news and read so many texts and seen so many things tweeted and seen so many things happening in your personal life and your financial life and in your public life and in your professional life. I want to talk to some people who are just running on empty. You're not happy, you're not sad, just empty. People keep asking you how you're doing and and you can't even find a word to articulate how you've been feeling because you're you're, you're not used to describing yourself as if your contents were gone because you've never been trained like you are here lately and you're just feeling empty. Empty is walking around with a sad face and nobody's died. Empty is walking around with any kind of an expression because you run out of the energy that it takes to have one. Empty is letting the kids do whatever they want to do and and you don't do anything about it because mama's empty. Empty's not having anything left. Who, Who wants to hire an empty person? You hire people, Brother Adam, for their creativity. You value them for their knowledge and their intellect. Sister Shella, you hire people who have passion and energy and insight and ideas. And God said, I don't want any of that stuff. I I, I don't don't want to dance. I don't want creativity. I don't want passion. Go borrow me some empty vessels. I'm not not concerned about how they look. I I don't care if they're chipped on the top. I I don't care where you get them from. I'm not not being particular. The only thing I'm asking is that you bring me something that is empty. You see, God values values you the most when you're not full, when you're not overflow, not when you're overflowing, not when you have all kind of, uh, of creative uh, insight and energy. God values you the most when you're empty. Hallelujah. 
You see, God creates empty. In the book of Genesis, when he reached down into the earth and he formed man from the dust of the earth, he formed an empty vessel. He, he was careful. He didn't form it full. He formed it empty. And he wanted it to be empty so he'd have something to blow into. Out of the dust of the earth, an old clay pot, an old empty vessel called Adam made of red earth, God shaped him and formed him. And when he made him empty, that's what God was attracted to. Somebody shout empty. Somebody shout empty. So there is God. There he is. The master himself hovered over top of an empty vessel as if he were an eager eagle hovering over an egg. As if it were about to hatch something. God, you understand, came down from eternity, stepped over into time and hovered over an empty vessel. And he was so attracted to it that he kissed the empty vessel. And when he kissed it, he blew the breath of life into it its mouth and it became a living soul. I don't know who I'm preaching to but God is getting ready to kiss somebody. God's getting ready to kiss somebody who's been walking around for the last three weeks, last three days, last 14 months with an indescribable emptiness town on the inside of you, a void, a vacuum that nothing seems to fill. Can I talk to us today? You're watching TV, but you're distracted. You're listening to the news, but you're only half listening. You're going through all of the motions. Uh, you can't even remember for sure. Is this Wednesday or is this Thursday or is this Sunday? Is this Friday or is this Tuesday? You're just empty, but you need to know today that God is attracted to empty. And so he hovered over an empty vessel and he blew into it the breath of life and it became a living soul and as we turn the pages of the Bible and walk through the annals of time we see God tell Moses on the mountain top to go form a tabernacle and the Bible says Moses formed the tabernacle and once he got the tabernacle formed then God said fill it with furniture and he began to fill that which was empty with furniture and when he made the holies of ho the holy of holies God said when you make the holy of holies make it empty and because it is empty I will fill it with my glory and the glory was called Shekinah because God is Oh, I feel like preaching in this place God is attracted to empty the question is not are you full enough the question is are you empty enough because what God wants to come into his presence are not people who have it all together or people who have their hair just right God wants people to come into his presence that says God all I have room for is you and the Bible says if you are empty enough God will fill you let me say it this way he who hungers and thirsts after righteousness shall be filled I'm not going to feed you till you're hungry I'm not going to feed you till you're thirsty because I'm a God that is attracted to empty Is this okay? Can I talk to us? All across town. Excuse me, I got a knock on the door. Mama wanted me to come and ask you, can we borrow? You're empty. Son, we know your situation. We, we know what's going on. We know what's going on. You understand these are good old church folks. Tra tragedy doesn't get by church folks. If somebody's hurting or somebody's failed or somebody's messed up, church folks know all. We know all about it. And these boys start going neighbor to neighbor. 
block by block knocking on the door saying mama send me over here to ask you can we borrow empty and I can imagine the looks on their face saying I, I, we know that you don't have any food in the house we know that daddy died we know that provision is gone we, we know that the creditors are getting ready to come and you want to borrow an empty vessel are you crazy what in the world is going on in that house and still every single day can we borrow your empty and door by door and house house by house and neighbor by neighbor the boys went out and they all they gathered was empty and they kept coming back to mama's house bringing empty vessels one after another the, the, the Bible doesn't tell us how many they brought but the Bible does tell us that the oil did not begin to flow until it found empty you see there is a glory that God will only release on someone who comes into his presence and dares to come empty a place where we come in and say God I'm out of ideas I'm out of concepts I, I don't have anybody else to call God I am empty God says you're just right for me because what I've been waiting on you to do is to run out of yourself and what I've been waiting on you to do is run out of people to call and run out of people to trust and run out of people to explain yourself to and run out of people with all kinds of ideals. I've been waiting on you to run out of yourself, run out of what was in your head, run out of your education, run out of your intellect, run out of your reservoir of memorized scriptures. And when you get empty enough, I'm gonna come into your life and I will fill you with with the glory like you have never had before. Somebody shout empty. Somebody shout empty. Mama said we need to borrow your empty in house by house and neighbor by neighbor and person by person they kept borrowing empty because God is so big it isn't a question of if he can supply it the question is do I have enough empty to attract God's attention Little by little and house by house, neighbor by neighbor, neighbor, let me get enough empty. The Bible says after they had gathered enough empty vessels, their mother said, come in and shut the door. Somebody shout, shut the door. <laughs> This is a job for God. This is a job for the Lord of lords and the king of kings. We're going to be shut up in here together. And it's uncomfortable. Uh, but the Holy Ghost said it's a sign that something is about to flow. Uh, oh, I wonder if there's anybody in this building today that needs a blessing from the Lord. Uh, I wonder if there's anybody in this service today that needs a touch that goes beyond those five seconds chills. Is there anybody in here today that would be honest enough to say I need to shut the door on the news. Shut the door on the paper. Shut the door on my neighbors. Shut the door on my flesh. Shut the door on my pride. Shut the door on my will and get alone with God where he can do a work in my life that no one else can do. times when God just needs to be alone with us. We're required to shut the door. It's a private moment between us and God. Shut the door. God doesn't need any outside witnesses. They shut the door on Jairus' daughter and Jesus woke up the dead. They shut the door on the tomb and three days later Jesus walked out saying I'm still alive. <laughs> Whenever you shut the door and the oil is flowing. You're not going to want to leave that presence. Amen. When the door was shut, the phone stopped ringing. When people stopped coming over, when the door was shut and there was no way out, when the door was shut, that's when God began to move. And look at how he moved. They brought the empty vessels to the pot of oil she already had. She knew that it was a pot of oil. You see, a pot of oil is measurable. It's finite. How much oil is it? It is a pot of oil. 
What do you have in your house? Nothing save a pot of oil. <laughs> what is a pot of oil against all of these empty vessels? So she took a pot of oil. How much was it? It was a pot of oil. And she picked it up. And when she when, when, and when the pot began to pour, the oil began to flow. It, it was a pot until she poured it out. See, we think we know what we have. We think we understand how much we can do. But you don't know what you have until you start pouring it out. As long as you save it and hide it and tuck it away, you'll never know what you have. It is only through the process of pouring that we discover the magnitude of the miracle. You think you know what you can do. You don't know what you can do until you have poured it out. It's when you pour, you multiply. It's when you pour, you get increase. It's when you pour that you go from finite to infinite. Somewhere between being straight up vertical and being turned horizontal as the oil began to flow, that oil started multiplying. And as long as they had an empty vessel, the Bible says the oil continued to flow. So the oil is not flowing in proportion to the container. Oh, it is flowing in proportion to the emptiness of what is in front of it. We serve a God where the more you put in front of him, the more he's gonna flow. I wonder if somebody would clap your hands and shout a prayer. What are you saying, pastor? I'm saying if you want God to fill you, you have to come empty. If you want God to bless you, you have to come empty. If you want God to help you, you have to come empty. If you want God to heal you, you have to come empty. If, if you want God to deliver you, you have to come empty. Pastor, I don't understand. I go to church every Sunday. I pay my tithes and I give extra in the offering and I come to prayer meeting and I lift everybody up in prayer. I'll tell you what your problem is, honey. There are things in your life that you have not let go of and your vessel is not empty. You're hanging on to things that you don't need to worry about having control of. Get rid of that junk in your life, in your mind, in your spirit, in your attitude and in your soul. Clean your vessel out and see that God will not work on your behalf. Somebody shout empty. Religion has us convinced that we need to look a certain way. We need to jump a certain way. We need to pray a certain way. We need to praise and worship a certain way. Religion taught us we need to make sure nobody knows we're struggling. Am I being real? Yeah. Yeah. Religion's taught us that, that nobody should know that we're broke. Nobody should know that we failed. Nobody should know that we messed up. And that is contrary to what the word of God is telling us this morning. You, you understand God doesn't care how straight your tie is and how coordinated your outfit is. He doesn't care that you sprayed enough juice on your fro today, that it's staying in place this entire service. He doesn't care that you keep that smile propped up on your face all day long. He only cares that you're empty. We run around saying, God, I want you to heal me. God, I want you to save me. 
God, I want you to deliver me. God, I want you to set me free. God, I need you to bless my finances. And God is saying, if you would just get out of the way, if you would just come to me empty, if you would get rid of everything you think you could do and count on me. We have to be empty. He created this world, we know. And after he created it, Brother Frank, it was beautiful. The Bible says every day of creation, at the end of that day, he looked back on what he did and says it is It was a beautiful place, but he looked at the fields and he looked at the sky and he looked at the seas and he saw empty. It was good, but when he saw empty, he could not help himself and he had to feel them. You see, this woman was experiencing a miracle as the oil poured from a pot, filling every empty vessel they could find. But when they ran out of empty, the Bible says the oil stayed. The miracle only stayed when there was nothing else to fill. This reminds me of when Jesus laid his hands on the disciples and he blessed them. He said, boys, I want you to go to Jerusalem. And he said, don't start preaching until you're empty. And the Bible said that all of these disciples were in the upper room and they had not been filled with the Holy Ghost. But when the day of Pentecost was fully come, and they were all in one place with one accord. They were all experiencing the same thing. They had gotten to a place where they cleaned everything out of themselves. They were in one place, in one accord. They were unified. They were all empty. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven like as a mighty rushing wind. If you study that out, the word literally interpreted talks about gale force winds in excess of 80 miles an hour as a mighty rushing wind on the inside of this building and cloven tongues like as a fire appeared and sat upon each of them and I think it's important for us to note that it did not stop there it says and they were all filled with the holy with the Holy Ghost. If you want God to fill you, you have to come empty. If you want God to bless you, you have to come empty. If you want God to help you, you have to come empty. If you want God to deliver you, you have to come empty. Somebody shout empty. That's what God wants when you finally run out, when you finally get empty, when you run out of ideas, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were in one place with one accord and suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind cloven tongues appeared like as a fire and sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the baptism of the Holy God I said come empty pastor I need a miracle you need to empty yourself and let God God, go. I have nothing else. I have nothing else but you, God. All my plans, all my ideas, all my position is God. I'm empty. Would you stand to your feet today as I close?
I told you I had a message. You came seeking a miracle. You came seeking an answer. You came seeking direction. You came seeking guidance. You came seeking joy. You came seeking peace. You came seeking comfort. You came seeking companionship. And God sent your pastor to this pulpit today to let you know he is seeking empty. There is a power in empty that you will never find anywhere else. Somebody in this service needs to empty themselves out and allow the power of God to do what needs to be done in your life. What does that mean, Pastor? That means you have to get rid of everything that would water down the move of God and attempt to convolute the power of the miraculous. I, I don't want a partial. I don't want a partial blessing. I'm tired of being tired. I'm tired of walking around defeated. I'm, I'm tired of coming to church and people working me up in a frenzy. And five minutes after I walk out the door, that same thing that has haunted me my whole life, slapping me upside the head and saying, get back in line. You're not hearing me today. I'm telling you there's a God that wants to do for you what you've been talking about. But you have to come empty. You have to say, God, here it is, all of it. I'm getting it out of the way from the top of my head to the tip of my toes. I want to be empty because I need you more. I need anything else. I know you don't want anyone to know that you're hurt and I know you don't want anyone to know that you need help. But the only one that you really need is attracted to empty. Bartimaeus cried, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. I got nothing left. I've been sitting here my whole life waiting for somebody to help me waiting on somebody to give me my next fix. I can't take it. I'm empty. A woman with the issue of blood had tried everything the Bible said. She had seen all kinds of doctors, had sought witchcraft and everything else. But when she heard Jesus was passing by, she emptied all of that stuff out of her. And when she couldn't get to him standing up, she got down on her hands and knees and crawled through the crowd just to touch the hem of his garment. I am empty. Don't get in the way of God's ability to work in your life. Understand the power of empty. Now, I've been around long enough to know and in a crowd this size and all of those that have tuned in on Facebook that there are people who are struggling with all kinds of things. There's fear, there's doubt, there's depression, there's discouragement, there's all kinds of things that's happening represented in this service. And I believe with all of my heart if you will accept this message today, before we leave this building, there is going to be a wave of glory. I'm prophesying to you right now. There will be a wave of glory that flows across this building over and over and over and it's going to heal and it's going to set free and it's going to deliver and it's going to do things in your life you never thought possible. But somebody has to say, I'm empty. I'd ask you if you would, for all of our guests, our altar services happen right, happen right where we're at. You can stand, you can be seated, you can kneel, you can do whatever you want to do. 
but we're going to spend some time in an altar service. And I'm asking, I'm asking for a couple of people that would just say, I'm going to believe with you, Pastor, that there's going to be a release of the miraculous in this place. Anybody agree with me right now? All right, all right, use those outdoor voices and let's begin to pray. Come on, lift up your voice. You've heard enough from me today. Lift up that voice right now, God. I'm always amazed at your word. I'm, I'm always amazed at how your word can just pinpoint areas within us that are so troublesome. God, I, I believe with all of my heart today that your word went forth because there are a number of people who have been struggling with all kinds of things. Oh, there are people in this place today that carry hurt, carry pain, carry guilt, carry condemnation, and have for years. They carry it around with them. It's been, it's been a struggle to let it go. And every time they, 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 they try to let it go, somebody's there to remind them. There are people here today that, that need deliverance that have been fighting with the same thing for a number of years. And just when they're about to defeat it, it comes roaring back. There are people in this building today that need healing in their body. They, they, they need divine intervention in their body. God, it is so easy for us to get distracted by modern medicine and, and by what the physician says and, and, and by this or by that. It's so easy. God, I pray in your name that this word right now would pierce the darkness, the loneliness, the discouragement, the depression, the disease. That it would pierce the addiction. That it would pierce the mistake, the failure. God, I pray in your name right now that it would pierce it all and that you would allow us to understand we don't have to put on a mask or a front. We, we, we we're not required to, to make sure that we've got it all together before we come into your presence. God, it is, it is not your will that we try to, to, to put together a little box inside of ourselves and wrap it up and put a nice little bow on it so it's presentable. As a matter of fact, God, I believe with all of my heart you just want us just cleaned out as, as well as we could be cleaned out. And it doesn't matter what we look like on the outside as long as the inside is clean. I pray in your name right now for a cleansing all across this building from the front to the back, from side to side. God, I pray right now for a cleansing to happen. Come on, somebody ask him, God, help me to clean myself out. Some of you need to look at your stuff, look at your junk, look at that trash you've been carrying around and say, I let it go. I release it right now. I don't want it anymore. God, I release it. In the name of Jesus. Facebook, we love you. We'll see you on. We'll see you next week. God bless you.